Good afternoon. Happy Juneteenth. My name is Kurt Witcher, and I'm Director of Special Collections for the Allen County Public Library. And I'm also a member of the Friends of the Lincoln Collection of Indiana. And it's both these wonderful organizations that brought this program to you today. I'm really excited about what we have to offer today and about our main keynote speaker. Before we get to that, though, I would like to introduce my colleague, Kim Bolin, who's the Chief Operating Officer for the Allen County Public Library, to bring you greetings on behalf of the library. Well, greetings and salutations. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi, how are you? Nice to see you, Tony. So nice to see all of you here today. Uh, welcome to the Allen County Public Library. Uh, and I especially want to thank you all for being here on Juneteenth and this, uh, attending this very special event today, which is so important for our community as well as for the library with our mission of lifelong learning. So with that, I will just cut, by, cut it short, say enjoy yourself, and turn it back to Kurt. Have fun, everyone. It gives me particular pleasure uh, to introduce to you the president of the Friends of the Lincoln Collection of Indiana. Um, our president, Todd Stevenson, has really been a leader uh, of great import to the Lincoln Collection and to really us being here today. Uh, he supported the Lincoln Endowment at a very significant level. He has served as treasurer of the Friends of Lincoln and as president of the Friends of the Lincoln Collection in Indiana. He has guided us through really wonderful periods of growth and capitalizing on opportunities and looking forward for the Friends of the Lincoln Collection and also for the patrons, the citizens, the people that we serve and those people we want to serve. So if you enjoyed the program today, and I'm sure you will, tell your friends, your neighbors, those who you run into that uh, the Friends of the Lincoln Collection in the Allen County Public Library are two places you really want to really follow. So I would like to introduce to you our president of the Friends of the Lincoln Collection, Todd Stevenson, who will introduce our presenter. Well, thank you, Kurt and Kim, and uh, also thank you both for allowing us as part of the Friends to be part of this important day here at the Allen County Public Library. We know that uh, for the last several years, the Juneteenth holiday has been a special part of the library's mission, and we're very glad that we're be able today uh, to include our Roland Lecture as, uh, as part of that. Um, you've already heard uh, you know, from their uh, opening and from their uh, welcome, how pleased they are to have uh, this group assembled here today and then online for Zoom uh, 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 participation in the 2024 Roland Lecture. Uh, for those of us that have had the honor of working for or knowing Ian Roland, we know how pleased he would be to know that this lecture is being held today on this important holiday, uh, Juneteenth. Um, as you know, Ian was a tireless advocate for the preservation and perpetuation of Abraham Lincoln's legacy, and importantly, ensuring that all our citizens can truly participate in and benefit from the core principles and freedoms underlying our nation. How fitting, then, that we are here today to recognize the significance of this holiday and to do so with this year's Roland Lecture a lecture series that began over 12 years ago and has recently included such renowned Lincoln historians and authors like James Oakes and Harold Holzer. To carry on that strong lineup, we have Jonathan White with us today. Before I formally introduce uh, John, I would like to encourage everyone here to stick around after John's lecture and Q&A period. We have a very significant presentation uh, to make downstairs at the uh, uh, front of the Roland Center. So please stick around and please you're all invited to participate in that and we also have with that uh, a brief reception that we're being, that's being held uh, uh, in honor uh, of the Roland Center in conference rooms B and C. So again, I will repeat that at the end of the 
uh, Jonathan's lecture. Um, now on to Jonathan. Jonathan White, PhD, is Professor of American Studies at Christopher Newport University. He is author or editor of 17 books and more than 100 articles, essays, and reviews about the Civil War, slavery, and emancipation, African American history, Abraham Lincoln, and the U.S. Constitution. He is a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, serves on the board of directors of the Abraham Lincoln Institute and the Abraham Lincoln Association, and is vice chair of the Lincoln Forum. He also serves on the Ford's Theater Advisory Council, the editorial board of the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, and as editor of both our own Lincoln Lore for the last year and also the Lincoln Forum Bulletin. His recent books include A House Built by Slaves, African American Visitors to the Lincoln White House, which was published in 2022, and Shipwrecked, A True Civil War Story of Mutinies, Jailbreaks, Blockade Running, and the Slave Trade in 2023. And just this year earlier, he published his first children's book, My Day with Abe Lincoln. His articles have appeared in a wide variety of journals, magazines, periodicals, including the Smithsonian Magazine, Civil War History, The Journey of the Civil War, and The Washington Post, The American Scholar, and Time Magazine. Jonathan began his education at Penn State, where he studied under Mark Neely. That should be a name that's familiar to some of you, since Mark also served as our editor of Lincoln Lore and director of the Lincoln Museum here in Fort Wayne from 1972 through 1992. Thanks to Mark's mentorship of Jonathan, we are fortunate to have John with us today, not only as one of today's preeminent and un unquestionably its most prolific current historians, but also to carry on the legacy of previous renowned Lincoln Lore editors, including Mark and our own Sarah Gabbard. With that impressive background and strong connection to our history and to our mission, on behalf of the board and members of the Friends of the Lincoln Collection, it is my pleasure to introduce our 2024 Roland Lecture Speaker, Jonathan White. Thank you so much, Todd. It's really a thrill to be here. This is my third visit to Fort Wayne. And I love coming here. In part, you know, I used to hear about the Lincoln Museum from Mark Neely when I was an undergraduate at Penn State back in the late 90s and early 2000s. And he was such an incredible mentor to me. And I know how much he means and meant to this place and how Lincoln shaped his career. And so much of that came out of the work he did right here in Fort Wayne. I have to just say, as a baseball fan, I love your Tin Cap Stadium. You guys have something really special there. I went to a game uh, a year ago, and then I went last night for the fireworks, and I think I'm going to go again tonight. So I, I really love uh, that aspect of this city. And, um, and I also really enjoyed getting to talk with students or kids this morning at the Grable Library. And I'm really grateful for that sort of opportunity. I, as Todd mentioned, I wrote this children's book earlier this year called My Day with Abe Lincoln. And it's about a little girl who travels back in time and meets Abraham Lincoln in Spencer County, Indiana in the 1820s. And she goes to school with him and then goes home to his cabin and learns a lot about how Indiana shaped his life. And I think that's a really important story that you all tell here and that more people need to know about. And so thank you to the library and to the Friends of the Lincoln Collection for having me and then also for having me get to talk to kids. It's one of my favorite things. The kids ranged from 16 months old to seventh grade and they were really wonderful. So today I'm here to talk about Abraham Lincoln, Juneteenth and the power of the Emancipation Proclamation. And I chose this topic because Juneteenth, of course, is the celebration of the anniversary, the moment that the enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, learned about emancipation in 1865. And I wanted to talk then today about what the Emancipation Proclamation did and what it meant, what it meant at the time that Lincoln issued it, what it meant to African Americans in that moment, 
And my hope is that in the process, we can capture something of Lincoln's character, and I would even say Lincoln's heart when he thought about the meaning of freedom in the United States. Now, to do that, we actually have to go back before the Emancipation Proclamation. And I'm going to take us back to August of 1860. This is before Abraham Lincoln is elected president. And it actually is going to take us to the west coast of Africa. In August of 1860, there was a very experienced slave trader named Nathaniel Gordon. Nathaniel Gordon was from Portland, Maine, so he was a New Englander, but as some of you may know, New Englanders were actually at the heart of the American and in fact the world slave trade, whether captaining ships or building them. And so Nathaniel Gordon had done several slave trading voyages between the west coast of Africa and Cuba or Brazil in the 1850s. And on this particular day in August of 1860, he picked up 897 Africans. Most of them were women and children. None appeared to be older than 40 years old, and some appeared to be as young as six months old. He purchased them with whiskey, and he loaded them onto his ship, and as he did so, he held some sort of bladed weapon, and he cut off the remnants of the clothes that the men and women were wearing, and used that knife to separate them so that as they went below decks, they were separated, men on one side, women on the other and he loaded them onto this ship, the Erie. And I show this picture, I, I discovered this picture in a, this painting in a private collection back in, in March and got permission from the owner to use it. So those of you who subscribe to Lincoln Lore will see this published essentially for the first time for the general public in Lincoln Lore in the current issue. Uh, this was Gordon's ship. He loads these 897 people on board and then he sets sail. Now, under international law at this time, there were British ships that were patrolling the west coast of Africa, and there were American naval ships patrolling the west coast of Africa. And under international law, the British ships could search British ships and ships of other powers of the world, but they were not allowed to search American ships. And the American naval vessels could search American merchant ships for evidence of slave trading, but they were not allowed to search any other nations because of the treaties that had been negotiated. And so Gordon set sail in the Erie, and he's out for a little while when he sees a ship on the horizon. And in that moment, he has to decide, do I think this is a British ship or an American ship? If he thinks it's a British ship, he'll run up an American flag. If he thinks it's an American ship, he'll run up another nation's flag. And taking a gamble in that way will determine whether or not this pursuing vessel can search him. Well, he takes a gamble. He assumes it's a British warship. He runs up an American flag, and you can see the American flag there. And then the USS Mohican runs up its flag. And they catch up to him, and they board him. They go below decks, and they find the 897 human beings who have been packed in very tightly for sale in the Western Hemisphere. And these are not the slaves who were rescued on Gordon's ship. These were rescued from another vessel. But if you look carefully at this photograph, you'll see all of the children. Again, someone like Gordon, the slave traders like him were going after the weakest of the weak. Well, Gordon was arrested and he was sent to New York City for trial. New York City was the financial center of the slave trade in the world at this point by 1860. It was also the commercial center of the United States. And most trials that involved the high seas, or many trials that involved the high seas that were federal cases, would be tried in New York. Now, Gordon was imprisoned in a place called the Eldred, Eldridge Street Jail. It was what we would today consider a minimum security prison. And Gordon knew that he had nothing to worry about because the President of the United States was a Pennsylvania doe face named James Buchanan. And by calling him a doe face, that means he was a Northern Democrat with Southern principles. He, he may have been a Pennsylvanian, but he was pro-slavery. And Gordon knew that he would not have to worry about anything. Slave trading had been illegal in this country since 1808. It had been piracy since 1820, but no one had ever faced the ultimate penalty for this crime. And Gordon was offered a plea deal, and he was so confident he would not get in any real trouble that he turned it down. And for a $50 bribe, the jailer would allow him to walk the streets of Manhattan and have dinners, someone said, as a gentleman. 
Well, Gordon went to trial with James Buchanan's prosecutor and marshal in charge, and it led to a hung jury. But then Lincoln became president. And in May of 1861, Lincoln called his cabinet together and told them that they were to destroy the transatlantic slave trade. He set his cabinet officials doing this. Well, Gordon's first trial ended in a hung jury, and that meant that he could be tried again because he was not acquitted. And so they decided, Lincoln's new U.S. Marshal, decided to move Nathaniel Gordon to what we would today consider a maximum security prison, which was known as the Halls of Justice or the Tombs. No longer for a $50 bribe could Nathaniel Gordon walk the streets of Manhattan. They took him to trial again, this time in November of 1861, and they learned their lesson from the first trial. At that first trial, some of the jurors were almost certainly bribed because the evidence was beyond doubt. And so this time, when they went to trial, they sequestered the jury, and this time, Nathaniel Gordon was found guilty, and he was sentenced to be executed. Now, depending on your view of capital punishment, you may say, well, this is good news. This is the first time in the history of the country that someone who has participated in one of the most egregious crimes against humanity that one could imagine, he's finally going to receive the just punishment he deserves. But believe it or not, thousands and thousands and thousands of Northerners wrote to Abraham Lincoln seeking pardon. This is one of the petitions that Lincoln received. You can see on the right-hand side, nearly 200 people signed this. And you may or may not be able to make out the words at the top of this printed petition, which was printed so that they could make multiple copies and get people to sign multiple copies to send them in. The argument here was, Nathaniel Gordon has a really nice mom and a nice sister and a young wife with a baby and some really sweet friends. He's got a great circle of friends. You wouldn't want to execute someone who's surrounded by all these great people, would you? Other people wrote to Lincoln and said, Nathaniel Gordon never saw it coming because no one's ever been punished for this before and it wouldn't be right to execute him. You know, justice has been done just by finding him guilty. People will be persuaded no longer to participate in the slave trade. And Lincoln starts getting all of these petitions. The execution was set to take place in February of 1862 and Actually, Nathaniel Gordon's wife and mother hurried to the White House to meet with Lincoln to try to persuade him. Well, as many of you probably know, February of 1862 was a very difficult time in Abraham Lincoln's life. He could not get General George B. McClellan to move against Richmond. He was very frustrated politically and militarily. And at the same time, Lincoln's two little boys, Willie and Tad, were very sick. And before the month would be out, Willie, age 11, would be dead. And with all of this personal and political pressure on Abraham Lincoln, he just couldn't bear to meet with these two women. He said, they can talk to Mary. I refuse to talk with them. They talked to Mary Lincoln. They pleaded with her. She went to her husband to plead on their behalf to spare Nathaniel Gordon's life. And in this moment, Lincoln did a characteristically Lincoln-esque thing. He issued a two-week stay of execution. His theory was this, Nathaniel Gordon didn't think he'd be executed, fine. I will give him two weeks to think about what he's done. In Lincoln's words, to prepare for that awful change which awaits him. And in writing out this two-week stay of execution, this is a scan from the National Archives, and you probably can't, you might be able to make out the handwriting there. That was written by a clerk, not by Lincoln, but Lincoln wrote this. In granting this respite, it becomes my painful duty to admonish the prisoner that, relinquishing all expectation of pardon by human authority, he refer himself alone to the mercy of the common God and Father of all men. What is Lincoln doing here? Well, the Supreme Court in 1857 in the Dred Scott decision had said that Africans and their descendants in America were nothing but articles of merchandise to be bought and sold whenever a profit could be made. People like Nathaniel Gordon saw Africans and African Americans as subhuman, as as a commodity. And in this moment, Lincoln was saying to Gordon, you have two weeks to think about what you've done before you meet your maker, and you better repent of what you've done Because while you see black people as subhuman, 
They are image bearers made in the image of God who deserve dignity and respect. They are made in the image of the common God and Father of all men. And so Gordon had two weeks to think about it. Well, the night before the execution was scheduled to take place, a friend of Gordon snuck some poison into the tombs hidden in a cigar. And Gordon took the poison in the middle of the night, and the guards heard him writhing in pain. But they would not allow him to cheat the gallows. They went in, they saw what was happening, they summoned a physician who came and pumped his stomach to force him to vomit out the poison. And the next morning, they roused him from bed and walked him to the gallows. And around noon, he was executed. The only slave trader in American history to be executed for his crimes. And people talk to Lincoln about why he did this. Why did you execute this guy? And Lincoln told a congressman from Massachusetts, I never will pardon any person who for paltry gain and stimulated only by greed can rob Africa of her children to sell into interminable bondage. Lincoln said, that man may rot in jail before he will get any relief from me. Now, this gives you a sense of how Lincoln was taking steps against slavery before the Emancipation Proclamation, from the very second month or third month of his presidency. I want to tell some more stories that come from before this period of the Emancipation Proclamation, and I will get to the proclamation itself as well. This is a man named Robert Smalls, and many of you may be familiar with Smalls. He is a a really important figure in American history. Robert Smalls was born into slavery in South Carolina. And in the spring of 1862, he was working on a Confederate ship called the Planter that you see here. And he was not pro-Confederate. He was not doing it because he supported the Confederacy. He was enslaved and was being forced to work on this ship. And he essentially learned how to pilot the ship while he was working on the Planter. And in May of 1862, he hatched a plan to steal the Planter and escape through the Union blockade and turn it over to Union naval authorities. And so he and several friends on May 13th, 1862, stole the planter along with their wives and children. And they did this because they knew that when you were in slavery, there was an ever-present threat of being sold away from your family or having your family sold away from you. And he could not bear the thought of losing his wife and children. And so having served on the ship, he knew what to do. He put on an outfit so that he looked like a ship captain. He had a hat on that made him look like a captain. And at night before dawn on May 13th, they sail out of Charleston very courageously. They had to go past the Confederate guards. He had to signal to them that they, they thought he was a Confederate. But the danger didn't end there. Then he gets out to the Union blockading vessels, and he has to somehow persuade them that he's not a Confederate ship attacking, or they might shoot and kill him. And so he does that. And for this daring act of bravery, he becomes a hero in the North. In August of 1862, Robert Smalls traveled to Washington, D.C., where he delivered a speech before a mixed-race audience of 1,200 people at the church of Henry McNeil Turner. And Turner later wrote about what an extraordinary speech this was that that Smalls gave. And he called him a, a, a genuine specimen of African heroism. And while Smalls was in Washington, D.C., he went to the White House and met with Abraham Lincoln. Now, there's no record that I have been able to find that survives that tells what their conversation was. But I've been studying Abraham Lincoln for a long time, and my hunch is that Abraham Lincoln said to him, can you tell me the story about how you stole the planter? Now, why might this matter? Well, in 1862, the Emancipation Proclamation had not yet been written. African Americans had been offering their services to the Union Army for more than a year, and Lincoln's administration had roundly rejected the service of black men. They said, this is a white man's conflict, it doesn't involve you. And by the way, Lincoln worried that black men might, move, might prove cowardly on the battlefield. He said at one point that summer that if we put guns into the hands of black men, they might just as soon wind up in the hands of the enemy. But now, Lincoln met a black man who had fought bravely and courageously for his freedom, the freedom of his family, and the freedom of his friends. 
And when Robert Smalls returned to Beaufort, South Carolina, he bore with him a letter from the War Department that authorized the enlistment of black soldiers. And the first black troops to be raised in South Carolina were raised as a result of that letter that Smalls carried. And I believe it was a meeting between Lincoln and Robert Smalls that went on to start a process that would ultimately lead to 200,000 black men serving in the Union Army, 10% of the Army, and what Lincoln came to see as an essential part of Union victory. Now, Lincoln was also persuaded by other African Americans that he met during the war to change his policies. In the 1840s, as a young politician, Lincoln had mocked the idea of black men having the right to vote. And believe it or not, the Democrat Martin Van Buren had supported black suffrage in New York in the 1820s. And as a young politician, Lincoln used this to go against Van Buren when he was running for president in the 1830s and 40s. Now this, then, fast forward a couple of decades, Lincoln still doesn't support black voting rights. But beginning in March of 1864, delegations of black men from the South begin coming to the White House and meeting with Abraham Lincoln to push for the right to vote. One of those delegations in April of 1864 was led by this man here, Abraham Galloway. Abraham Galloway had been born in bondage in North Carolina. He escaped by hiding on a turpentine ship in the hold of the ship and made his way to Philadelphia. And the power of the turpentine, the chemical reaction on his body was so strong that when he got out of the ship in Philadelphia, blood was pouring out of his pores. But now he was free. And Galloway spent the next number of years in the north, and then when the Civil War began, he moved back to North Carolina where he helped Union forces as a spy and also to help recruit black soldiers. And in April of 1864, Abraham Galloway led a group of six black men to the White House. When they got there, they didn't know what to expect. They brought with them a petition that pointed to the Declaration of Independence claiming we as black men should have the right to vote. And they also pointed out that black men had the right to vote in North Carolina from 1776 until 1835. And he said there had been no problems when black men voted before, we should have the right to vote again. They got to the White House, and I have this side of the White House up on purpose, because they didn't know if they'd be let in. But not only were they let in, they were welcomed through the front door. And one of the men who was part of this delegation was a, a minister named Isaac, Isaac Felton. And Isaac Felton later said that it would have been an insult for a person of color to enter the front door of the lowest magistrate in Craven County and to ask for the smallest right. And Felton said that if, if a black person had dared to do that in North Carolina, he said, he would have been told to go around to the back door, that is the place for the N-words. But then Felton said, and he, he, he alluded here to the, the Sermon on the Mount, he likened Lincoln to Christ. He said, we knock and the door is opened unto us. We seek the president and find him to the joy and comfort of our hearts. We ask and receive his sympathies and promises to do for us all that he could. He didn't tell us to go around to the back door, but like a true gentleman and noble-hearted chief with, with as much courtesy and respect as though we had been the Japanese embassy, he invited us into the White House. And Lincoln welcomed them in, he shook their hands, which would have been unthinkable for most white people to do in the 1860s. He listened to their petition and he agreed with them that they should have the right to vote. He explained that as president, he had no authority over that, it was a state matter that would have to be controlled during Reconstruction. But around this time, Lincoln began working behind the scenes to push for black suffrage. And just after having met with a different delegation, from Louisiana, Lincoln sent this letter to the governor of Louisiana with, again, some beautifully Lincoln-esque language. Lincoln wrote, I barely suggest for your private consideration whether some of the colored people might be let in, meaning let them into the franchise. As, for instance, the very intelligent, meaning the educated, and especially those who have fought gallantly in our ranks. They would probably help in some trying time to come to keep the jewel of liberty within the family of freedom. 
What was Lincoln saying here? Lincoln was recognizing that at some point the United States would be reunified and the South would join back with the North. And Reconstruction might not be pretty. And in this moment, Lincoln was recognizing that while there were millions of disloyal traitors in the Confederacy, there was also a very loyal population there, the formerly enslaved. They had been loyal all along. And what Lincoln was saying here is if you want democracy to survive, if you want small r Republican government to survive, the best way to do it is to welcome black men into the franchise, give them a voice in popular government. For the next year, from March of 1864 until April of 1865, Lincoln worked behind the scenes to try to persuade Southern governments to, to think about black voting rights as they came back into the Union. Finally, on April 11th, 1865, Lincoln comes out publicly advocating for black suffrage, the first time in the history of the nation that a sitting president did that. He did it in a speech outside at the, on the balcony of the White House. In the audience that night was a young actor named John Wilkes Booth. And Booth turned to his companion and said, that means N-word citizenship. By God, that'll be the last speech he ever gives. I'll put him through. And of course, four days later, Abraham Lincoln was dead. Now, so far, I haven't even gotten to the Emancipation Proclamation itself. And so I want to say a couple of things about that. The Emancipation Proclamation is often criticized today. Lincoln is often criticized for being too slow in issuing the proclamation. And I'm not going to talk about that just now, but I'd be happy to during the Q&A if you want to ask about that. But Lincoln is also criticized for his motivation. Many people today say, well, Lincoln's heart really wasn't in black freedom. He only did it because it was a way of helping him win the war. And the Emancipation Proclamation didn't really free anybody anyway. And so those are the two criticisms of Lincoln that I want to address. And I want to tell a couple of stories to try to capture my understanding of the Emancipation Proclamation. The first story I want to tell involves two black men from Arkansas. Their names were David Lamb and Jake Glover. They were enslaved by a man named George Redmond who was 72 years old. George Redmond and his son Reuben owned a tremendous amount of land on the west side of the Mississippi River in Arkansas. In probably about October of 1862, they escaped from the Arkansas side of the river to the Memphis side of the river, and they begin living in the black community in Memphis, which is known as a contraband area. These are African-American refugees from slavery who are finding protection within Union military lines, and so they're living in Memphis. But David Lamb still has two teenage daughters who are being held by Colonel Redmond, and Lamb desperately wants them free. At various points over the next few months, he pleads with Colonel Redmond to free his daughters, and Redmond roundly refuses. And so in August of 1863, David Lamb, and I should say, I don't have any photographs of Lamb and Glover, so I've, I've put up images of other black refugees here. David Lamb crosses the river, meets with his daughters, Matilda and Nancy. They're 15 and I want to say 18. Tells them, Tomorrow night, I'm going to come to free you. Meet me at the cornfield. And so the night is set, and Lamb and Jake Glover and several other black men get into skiffs, and they paddle across the Mississippi River. They meet up with the girls at the appointed time, at the appointed place, and one by one, the father takes his daughters to freedom. In the process of rescuing the second girl, George Redmond wakes up, and he pursues them down to the river. He fires a warning shot, and Jake Glover, well, David Lamb fires back. He fires to scare off George Redmond, shoots over his head, but Jake Glover fires a, a slug, which is essentially a buckshot, and it, it spreads in the air and hits George Redmond in the torso. George Redmond is taken back to his farmhouse while the, the men rescue the girls and take them across the river. Within four days, George Redmond is dead, and this black family is back in Memphis. Well, word spreads about what happened, and the two black men are arrested. There is no functioning civil court system in Memphis at this time, so they are tried before a Union military court. 
Union soldiers will preside over this trial, and a soldier will, a soldier will serve as judge advocate and try to have them found guilty. They're, they go to trial, they're found guilty, and they're sentenced to be executed. But because this is a military court, the execution cannot be carried out until Lincoln approves it as president. The trial transcripts are sent to Washington, D.C., and in January of 1864, Lincoln reviews them. And Lincoln didn't write much, but we know the argument that was presented to Lincoln, and we know he adopted it. Their lawyer wrote that the Emancipation Proclamation had declared these girls free. And there's a little line in the Emancipation Proclamation that's usually forgotten where Lincoln enjoined black men and women not to use violence unless in cases of self-defense. And here was a man rescuing his daughters from slavery. And Lincoln looked at this case file and pardoned the men. From Lincoln's perspective, the Emancipation Proclamation had declared these two teenage girls free, and a father has a right to rescue his children from illegal bondage. And when people tell me that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't do anything, I love to tell them the story about David Lamb and Jake Glover and Matilda and Nancy Lamb, because in this case, the Emancipation Proclamation was a law that literally saved people's lives. Now, many of you probably know that Frederick Douglass was a significant critic of Abraham Lincoln's for much of the Civil War years. But Douglass met Lincoln three times during the Civil War, and those moments transformed the way that Douglass thought about Lincoln. Douglass later remarked that Lincoln welcomed him at the White House as one gentleman welcomes another. And Douglass said on many occasions that Lincoln never treated him differently on account of the color of his skin. Well, the second meeting between these two men took place in August of 1864. The Civil War was going very badly in that month, and Lincoln became convinced that he would lose in his bid for re-election. And Lincoln knew that if he lost, the Democrat who beat him, George McClellan, would rescind the Emancipation Proclamation and that the chance for freedom would be gone. And so Lincoln summoned Frederick Douglass to come to the White House for a meeting. And Douglass came into his office, and the two men shook hands, and then they sat down. And they talked politics for a few minutes. And then Doug Lincoln looked at Douglass, and he said, Douglass, I hate slavery as much as you do and want to see it abolished altogether. And Lincoln then explained the problem. He said, I issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and the slaves aren't running away as fast as I had thought they would. And Douglas replied by saying, well, the problem there is the slaveholders aren't telling the enslaved people about the, the proclamation, so they don't know to run away and get their freedom. And the two men then sat down together and concocted a plan modeled after John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, where they would send what Douglas later called bands of scouts into the Confederacy, essentially telling the slaves, run away now while you still have the chance, because once Lincoln is out of office, your chance for freedom will be gone. Now, this moment, I actually learned the significance of this moment from Mark Neely in an essay he published in the 1990s that he probably wrote while he was still here in Fort Wayne. And what Neely points out in that essay is that this moment shows just how thoroughly Lincoln's heart was in emancipation. When we think about the Emancipation Proclamation, many critics today say, well, Lincoln's heart really wasn't in black freedom. He only did it to save the Union. He only did it as a military necessity. It was only about winning the war. But if we think about this moment, what was Lincoln doing with his friend, Frederick Douglass? And Douglass is the one who said they were friends, and so did Lincoln for that matter, actually. They both called each other friend. What are they doing? Freeing the slaves in this way had nothing to do with winning the war, it had nothing to do with saving the Union, it had nothing to do with military necessity. It had everything to do with getting freedom to as many people as possible before Lincoln was out of office. And Douglas later said this, what he said on this day showed a deeper moral conviction against slavery than I had ever seen before in anything spoken or written by him. I listened with deepest interest and the profoundest satisfaction. 
Well, I want to tell just one or two more stories that I think capture a, a really important aspect of Lincoln's career when it comes to black freedom during the Civil War. And this one, if you've heard me speak before, you've maybe heard about this, but this, is a st this next one is a story that is almost entirely unknown. It involves a young black woman named, named Elizabeth Shorter. She was probably about 18 or 20 years old when this takes place. We don't know exactly because she was born in slavery in Washington, D.C. If you know D.C., if you know the Brentwood area of D.C. near where Catholic University is today, that's where she was enslaved. She became free under the D.C. Emancipation Act, which was signed by Lincoln on April 16, 1862. And now she needed work, and she found work in the home of a D.C. cobbler, a shoemaker named Frank Pruitt. Now, Frank Pruitt was married, and his wife was pregnant. But one night, Frank shows up in the room where Lizzie is sleeping, and he sits down on the sofa next to her, and it's dark, and she doesn't know who it is, and she asks, who's there? And he says, it is me, Liz Frank. I want to get into bed with you, but don't want you to tell Lib, will you? Lib was his wife, in case you weren't sure. And Lizzie said she was tired, and she told him to go away, but the, the historical record very euphemistically says he persevered and got into bed with her. And this happened on several occasions, and soon Lizzie realized she was pregnant. She told Frank. He asked if the baby was his, and she said yes. And a baby girl named Rose was born on November 3rd, 1863. Sometime about Christmas, Frank told Lizzie that he wanted her to take the child and get out of the house. And she replied that she would only leave if he offered financial support, and he refused. Well, Lizzie learned that Frank was going to kick her out of the house, and so she decided to confront him in front of his wife, who by now had just had her child. It was a Sunday morning. Or she, she goes in. Sunday morning, she packs up her belongings. She's holding her baby, Rose. She knocks on Frank's bedroom door. She goes in, and she confronts him. And she says, look at the baby and look at me and remember what you have done to me. And he simply replies, well. And she reminded him that he had promised to take care of the child. And she said, if you don't do it, I will disgrace you on the morrow. And at this, Frank became furious and he looked at his wife and he said, Lib, do you believe that damned black bitch? And his wife looked at him. She's there holding her baby and she looked at him and she said, yes, Frank, I do. For the last three months, you have acted as if you were afraid of Liz. And at that, Frank Pruitt became furious, and he jumped out of bed. He grabbed a revolver. He pointed it at Lizzie and her child and said, God damn you, I never intended to die a natural death, and I'll blow your damned brains out. But his wife grabbed the pistol out of his hand and scolded him and said, Frank, a murder over my child. And at that point, Frank lunges at Lizzie, grabs her by the neck, shoves her against the wall, and tells her to get out. Well, later that day, Lizzie returned to get her belongings. And when she did, Frank's wife gave her some money and said, take this on the condition that you don't tell anyone about the connection between you and my husband. Well, the next day, Lizzie went to the courthouse in Washington, D.C., which is still there on Indiana Avenue, and she found a judge who was willing to issue a warrant for Frank's arrest. He went to trial on June 16, 1864, and Lizzie was allowed to testify in court, something that was new in American history because of a law that Lincoln signed allowing black people to testify in court against white people. But even with her testimony, Frank was acquitted. Sometime around this trial, Lizzie's baby died. Lizzie went to trial in October of 1864. She was very quickly found guilty of larceny, of stealing the money that Frank's wife had given her. And on November 3rd, what would have been her daughter's first birthday, she was sentenced to a year in the Albany Penitentiary in New York. The following day, Lizzie sent a letter to Abraham Lincoln. She was illiterate because it was illegal to, for enslaved people to learn how to read and write, so an unknown hand wrote the letter for her, and she signed it with her mark, which you see there. And she implored Lincoln for mercy. She said that she, and here's the, 
the full signature of the letter. She said that the money she had been given had been given to her by Mrs. Pruitt. She admitted what had happened between her and Frank Pruitt, but she said that she had not committed the crime of theft. Now, we don't know what Lincoln thought when he held this letter in his hand. Here's the, the beginning of the letter. She was convicted on the 3rd. She, or she was convicted in October. She was sentenced on November 3rd. She wrote the letter on the 4th, and Lincoln got this letter at the White House either on November 4th or 5th. And we know that Lincoln held this letter in his hand and read it. Now, what's interesting about Abraham Lincoln is that his own genealogy has some strikingly similar aspects to Lizzie Shorter's story. Lincoln believed that his mother had been born when a wealthy Virginia planter took sexual advantage of a poor young Virginia woman. And according to Lincoln's law partner, Billy Herndon, this was a painful memory for Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln also had very strong misgivings about society's double standards when it came to morality involving men and women, especially in cases of seduction. He thought it was wrong that women received more blame in cases of marital infidelity or extramarital sex than men did. And some of you may know this, in the 1830s, Lincoln actually wrote a poem about it. He wrote, whatever spiteful fools may say, each jealous ranting yelper, no woman ever played the whore unless she had a man to help her. <laughs> Every time I go to the Lincoln Memorial, I look up on the wall to see if they carve those immortal words <laughs> next to the Gettysburg Address in the, the second inaugural. So far, they haven't done it. Clearly, Frank Pruitt's sexual exploitation of Elizabeth Shorter offended Lincoln's sense of justice. And Lincoln also must have felt empathy for a young mother who had lost her child, which she mentioned in the letter. Lincoln, as all of you I'm sure know, lost two boys, two little boys, during his lifetime. And considering all of this evidence, Lincoln took Lizzie Shorter's letter, turned it over, and wrote, Pardon A. Lincoln, November 5, 1864. I think Lizzie Shorter's pardon may be the fastest pardon Lincoln delivered during his presidency. Sentence November 3rd, letter written November 4th, pardon granted November 5th. And if that's not enough, consider the circumstances. Within three days, Lincoln is going to stand for re-election in what I think is the most important presidential election in American history. And yet, Lincoln looked at this situation, he knew that Lizzie Shorter had been wronged, and he did what he could do within his power to rectify the situation. He showed that he would live up to the principles that he, wrote, that he discussed in the Gettysburg Address when he called for a new birth of freedom, so that government of the people, by the people, and for the people would not perish from the earth. Lizzie Shorter was one of those people who deserved justice. So I want to very quickly, I have no idea how long I've talked, and so I, I, I don't want to, I, I know the library closes at nine, but I want to be <laughs> respectful of your time. So I'm just going to very quickly talk about three more things, and then I'm happy to go to Q&A. I edited a collection of letters from African Americans to Lincoln uh, in 2021 called To Address You as My Friend, and it consists of 125 letters that black men and women, slave and free, wrote to Lincoln. Many of them were written by people who were semi-literate. Some were written by well-educated African Americans. Some were written by uneducated African Americans who had to have it, someone else write them for them. One of the most touching letters in this collection is this one from a man named Hannibal Cox. Hannibal Cox had been born in slavery near Richmond, Virginia. He had been denied an education because in Virginia it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read. After Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, Hannibal Cox joined the Union Army and the white soldiers around him began to teach him how to read. And Cox was so proud of the education that he was gaining that he wrote this letter to Lincoln. And he opened up the letter by mentioning his lack of education and how he's learning. And then he copied out several lines of poetry from Harper's Weekly 
about his pride in the American flag. The most touching part of this letter, though, is the little postscript at the bottom left. And you may be able to make out Cox's writing. Cox knew that his penmanship might not be perfect, his spelling might not be perfect, his punctuation certainly was not perfect. But he wanted Lincoln to see this, but he worried that Lincoln might look at this and not take it seriously. And so he wrote, I send this for you to look at. You must not laugh at it. And I love that sentiment. Because we all know that we naturally laugh at people when they make careless mistakes. And he, he worried that Lincoln might hold this letter in his hand and laugh. I don't think Lincoln laughed, though, when he read this letter. You see, most of the correspondence that Lincoln received was sent out through the federal bureaucracy and is now buried somewhere in the National Archives. The letters that really meant something to Lincoln, he kept. And they were found in his personal papers. They, after he was killed, they were turned over to his son, Robert, who eventually gave them to the Library of Congress. And Hannibal Cox's letter is among those at the Library of Congress. When Lincoln traveled around Washington, D.C., he often interacted with African Americans. At one point in May of 1862, he went to a hospital to greet convalescing soldiers to thank them for their service to the Union. And one of the white nurses there said, I want to introduce you to these three black cooks. These were refugees from slavery in Maryland and Kentucky who were serving the Union. And Lincoln went up to them and shook their hands and learned their names and said, how do you do Lucy? How do you do Brown? How do you do Garner? And we know their names today because of Lincoln's interaction with them. And what Lincoln didn't see in that moment was that the white soldiers he had just greeted were using the N-word to describe these black cooks. They could not believe that Lincoln would shake their hands. But Lincoln did, because from his perspective, they were serving the Union, and they deserved his gratitude and respect. Lincoln would often ride between the White House and the Soldiers' Home, which is a historic site you can still visit today. And when he did, he would often stop at what was known as the Contraband Camp, which, is, which was located near where Howard University is today. And one day, as Lincoln was preparing to make this visit, the commander of the camp came to him, or sorry, the commander of the camp came to a young black woman, a refugee from slavery who was in her 20s, and her name was Mary Dines. And he said, Mary, I want you to lead the people in singing for the president today. And Mary was very afraid to do this. And when the president arrived, she started singing, nobody knows the trouble I've seen but Jesus. She sang the first verse by herself. And in the second verse, the other contrabands joined in. And they proceeded to sing for an hour. And Lincoln joined in and sang. And she, she described how they sang, the they sang uh, glory, glory, hallelujah. His soul is marching on. And she said, the president has a sweet voice. And it sounded so sad when he tried to sing. And she said he really choked up once or twice. Now the thing that really jumps out at me at this moment, and this is a photograph of the black refugees at that contraband camp preparing to sing for Lincoln. And if you look carefully, you can see the songbooks in their hands. So these are the people who sang for Lincoln. Mary may be in this photograph, we just don't know. But Mary described how these refugees from bondage were much more charismatic in their approach to singing than someone like Lincoln who attended a Presbyterian church would have been. Mary said the singers seemed to forget that the president was there and they began to shout and yell, but he didn't laugh at them. And there's that same sentiment in her recollection that Hannibal Cox had in his letter. These young black refugees from slavery feared that Lincoln would treat them as different. And yet he didn't. And I think that says a lot about Lincoln's character. And it is little wonder that when Lincoln died in April of 1865, it was African Americans who felt the loss more keenly than white Americans did. One black army veteran said this, our faith was almost staggered and that faith which had sustained us in so many battles was now staggering under a blow which was severer than any battles, the death of our immortal leader. 
and hundreds and hundreds of African Americans, mostly black women and their children, came to the White House on April 15, 1865 to mourn Lincoln's loss. This is a story that I think has been lost for the last 160 years, the relationship, and I have just touched on it here, the relationships that develop between black men and women and Abraham Lincoln. But it's an, I think it's an important one, and it's one that on Juneteenth I wanted to bring back to light as Juneteenth celebrates the spreading of the power of the Emancipation Proclamation to Galveston, Texas, I wanted to reflect a little bit on what the proclamation meant to Lincoln. So with that, thank you so much for having me and for coming out. And if we have time until nine o'clock, I am happy to take questions. Thank you. Do you, do you know what um, a, by Abraham Lincoln's um, freed his freed his slaves freed his slaves and stuff? Do you know why he freed his freed his slaves? Sure. So Lincoln always believed that slavery was wrong, and in 1864 he said, "I have always believed that slavery was wrong. There is not any time that I did not so think and feel." At the same time, Lincoln didn't believe that as president, he could do anything he wanted to. And so Lincoln didn't believe that he could just issue an Emancipation Proclamation simply because he believed slavery was wrong. And so from the beginning of his presidency, Lincoln began striking at slavery in various ways to try to end it in ways that were both constitutionally permissible and also politically feasible. And the politically feasible is a really important thing, because a lot of people today say, why didn't Lincoln just issue a proclamation in April? If Lincoln had done that, the upper south and the border states would have seceded immediately, and he never would have been able to win the Civil War. So Lincoln begins striking at slavery through things like the going against the transatlantic slave trade. And I've written a whole book on that called Shipwrecked that looks at a number of different aspects of that story. He tries to work to free the slaves in the border states. He works with people in the loyal states to try to end slavery. He does everything he can to try to strike at slavery in ways that are permissible. By the summer of 1862, Lincoln becomes convinced that an Emancipation Proclamation is the best way to win the war. And so he calls his cabinet together on July 22nd, 1862, and tells them his plan. And they are mostly supportive, but his Secretary of State, William Seward, says, you know, the thing is, the war is going really badly right now, and if you issue an Emancipation Proclamation now, it's going to look like a sign of weakness to the powers of Europe. So imagine, to use a modern metaphor, a Hail Mary pass at the end of a football game. You only do it when you're really desperate to score. And so Seward persuades Lincoln, wait until you've won a victory on the battlefield, and then issue an Emancipation Proclamation. And Seward, uh, so Lincoln waits and waits and waits and finally issues it in, in September and then January of 1863. And the argument that Lincoln makes in the proclamation is that this is a military necessity and that he's doing it to win the war. And that's 100% true. I mean, why did Lincoln do it? He did it to win the war. He did it to defeat the Confederacy. Lincoln recognized that enslaved people were being used against their will to labor on behalf of the Confederacy, to build fortifications, to work on plantations and farms, to raise food for Confederate soldiers. And what Lincoln came to see was if you free the slaves you, and they join, you, they come over to Union lines, that you are, you are not only weakening the Confederacy by taking away that labor force, but then when you, you give them muskets and you arm them and make them soldiers, you're also strengthening the Union. And so it was as a military necessity that Lincoln chose to do it. What I hope to show in that Frederick Douglass meeting, though, is that while that was Lincoln's political and constitutional rationale, it was not his only motivation. And Lincoln, for his whole life, believed that he said all people of all colors should be free. And in that moment with Douglass, Lincoln was showing 
we need to make people free not just to win the war. Hey, I'm losing the election and we're going to lose the war. Like, this is not going well. But we still need to try to free as many people as possible. And so I view it as having both of these components. I saw the mic over there. Yeah. Mr. White, first of all, I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, you certainly have enlightened me uh, in terms of uh, uh, the relationship between Frederick Douglass and Lincoln himself. But one of the things that I'm puzzled about um, is after Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, it would seem like he would have anticipated the resistance. And that's, what, that's something that um, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat confused on because earlier in, in your presentation you had mentioned that he didn't understand why, you know, once the proclamation was initiated, mm -hmm. why the slaves just didn't leave. Do you, who do you mean resistance from? Because he receives resistance from a lot of people. Who are you thinking I'm talk, of? I'm talking about the Confederacy. Yeah. You know, I'm talking about the, you, you know, where the slaves were, were subjected, you, you know, to the racial discrimination, right? So, yeah. it's, you know, it seems like after he initiated the Emancipation Proclamation, he would have anticipated, I mean, where would the slaves go? Yeah, so w what the slaves have to do is flee to Union lines. And they actually begin doing that as early as, uh, well, they actually begin doing it after Lincoln's election, before he even is inaugurated. And then the most famous moment is in May of 1861 in my neighborhood in Hampton Roads, Virginia, three black men who were being forced to labor on behalf of the Confederacy flee to Fort Monroe and they say, take us in and the commander of the fort, Ben Butler, declares them contraband of war and says, okay, like contraband in a prison, something you're not allowed to have in prison. Butler's theory is, I'm gonna treat these people as contraband. I'm gonna say there's something that the Confederates are not allowed to have and we're not gonna give them back and we're gonna bring them into our lines and they can work on our behalf. And once word gets out, that, and, and so Butler does that in Hampton, Virginia. Once word gets out, started with three, then hundreds and hundreds of enslaved people from that area start flocking to Fort Monroe, getting protection. And then Lincoln allows that policy to take root anywhere that's not, so anywhere that's in rebellion. And so contraband camps rise up like in Memphis. Now, slaveholders start coming back and saying, oh, I'm loyal. I mean, it was BS, but a lot of them, I'm loyal, give me my property back. And in March of 1862, Lincoln signs a law that Congress passed that created a new article of war saying it's illegal for the Union Army to return fugitive slaves. So federal law requires the return of fugitive slaves, and Lincoln says the army will not be used for that purpose. And so what has to happen is slaves have to make a... a a bold and daring and dangerous decision to escape and get to Union lines. And if they can get there, that's where freedom will come. And there's still a lot of resistance. And I'll tell a quick story that is really remarkable and that often gets misused. Lincoln had an old acquaintance from Kentucky named George Robertson, who was a former slaveholder. And Robertson had a slave who escaped from Kentucky and found protection within Union Army lines within a Wisconsin regiment. And Robertson goes to the regiment and says, give me back my property. And the soldiers say no. And under law at that point, the army regulations were no. Now, this was after Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And what Lincoln very badly feared was that slaveholders are going to keep trying to do this and they're going to sue in the federal courts and they're going to take it all the way to the Supreme Court and keep in mind, Roger Tawney, the guy I quoted before who said Africans and African Americans are nothing but articles of merchandise to be bought and sold, that guy was still the Chief Justice of the United States. And so Lincoln worried, what happens if one of these slaveholders sues and it gets to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says, nope, Emancipation Proclamation is unconstitutional. So Lincoln reaches out to George Robertson, his former acquaintance, his former congressman, and says, let me purchase this slave from you. Now, if you Google this, you're going to 
uh, FYI, Abraham Lincoln once said, not everything on the internet is true. And <laughs> if you Google this, you will find people saying, Abraham Lincoln wanted to buy a slave. Now, if you just hear Abraham Lincoln wanted to buy a slave, that sounds pretty bad. Why did Lincoln want to buy it? Because this was a really prominent Kentuckian who had the means to take this to court, and Lincoln so badly didn't want the Emancipation Proclamation to get struck down in court that he was willing to try to buy a slave $500 of his own money to keep it out of court. And of course, he would have set the man free immediately. In fact, Lincoln never would have met him. I mean, the man was somewhere in Kentucky with this Wisconsin regiment. And I think that speaks to how Lincoln had to deal with so many different things to try that resistance where these slaveholders really are tenaciously trying to cling to slavery. I'm going to recommend a, a brand new book to you all written by a, a dear friend of mine named Robert Colby. It just came out about a month ago called An Unholy Traffic. And what Robert Colby has done is traced how the Confederates maintained the slave trade during the Civil War. No scholar had ever done this before. People just kind of assume, well, the, slave, the Civil War is going on, the slave trade stops. No, Confederates so tightly clung to the idea of property and man that they continue buying and selling enslaved people all the way up to April of 1865. Hmm. And that is something that Lincoln, through his armies, had to go against. When you talk about that resistance, and here's another quick story, sorry. Like Lincoln once said, once the preacher couldn't write a short sermon because once he got going, he just... Um, there was a man named Fountain Brown from Arkansas who knew the Union Army was approaching, and he took his slaves and sold them to Texas. And Fountain Brown was found out, and he was arrested by the Army and tried by a military commission in the same way that David Lamb and, and Jake Glover were. And the law he was charged with violating was the Emancipation Proclamation. And Lincoln said, I... I declared the slaves of Arkansas free, and you sold them illegally to Texas. And Fountain Brown died in jail because he had violated the law, and which was the Emancipation Proclamation. So there are a lot of, I don't know if I fully answered your question, there's so much going on, but that's, those are some examples of how Lincoln tried to fight that resistance. And last thing I'll say, I swear, and then I'll turn it to another question. Um, I wrote a book 10 years ago. It's actually the subject of my talk in this very room in 2014 called Emancipation, the Union Army, and the Re-Election of Abraham Lincoln. And what I do in that book is I show not only was Lincoln getting resistance from slaveholders in the South, thousands and thousands of white soldiers in the North said, I don't want to fight for black freedom. I'm not willing to fight in an N-word war. I'm willing to fight for the Union, but I'm not going to fight for those people. And what I show in that book is that Lincoln dealt with that resistance from his own soldiers by actually having them arrested and court-martialed. If you criticize the Emancipation Proclamation as a soldier, you were going to get arrested and court-martialed and then publicly punished. And what that did was it taught the other soldiers, maybe I better stop criticizing the commander-in-chief and get on board here. And I think it had a pretty profound effect. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, actually, this question goes into your previous comment. Uh, I've often been heard that one of the legal considerations that Lincoln had to make in developing the um, uh, Emancipation Proclamation was acknowledging that he was going to have to ignore the uh, Taney Court's ruling in Scott, Dred Scott. Yeah. And uh, I've always wondered, is that true? Did he purposely make the intention to ignore the Supreme Court ruling and not to raise any political issues? I just wonder if there's any precedent for that us today. Yes, it's a great question. So there is a lot of precedent for ignoring the Supreme Court, for presidents ignoring the Supreme Court. And the most famous is in 1832. So Andrew Jackson, the Supreme Court in 1819 in a case called McCullough versus Maryland had said that a national bank was constitutional. In 1832, Congress passes a a bill rechartering the bank, and Andrew Jackson vetoes it, and he says, I know the Supreme Court said this is constitutional. I don't care. I think it's unconstitutional, and I'm going to veto it. And Lincoln quoted that veto message at length in a speech he gave in Springfield, Illinois, on June 26, 1857, where Lincoln was criticizing the Dred Scott decision and said, um, he said, 
I know the Supreme Court has said this, that black people are not citizens and cannot sue in the federal courts. And Lincoln says, you know what? Okay, that case applies to Dred and Harriet Scott and their two daughters. That doesn't apply to anyone else. We can ignore it. We can fight it. We can try to get the Supreme Court to reverse itself. I wrote a book in 2011 about Abraham Lincoln and treason in the Civil War. And what I show in that book is that Lincoln took those principles and applied them to the civil liberties issue. So when Roger Tawney comes out in June of 1861 and says Abraham Lincoln can't arrest civilians and hold them without charges, Lincoln just responds by ignoring him, and he continues to do that. Now, did Lincoln do that for the Emancipation Proclamation? The answer is no. In that case, because the Dred Scott decision was dealing with different issues. So in the Dred Scott decision, the, the Supreme Court said three things. First, African Americans are not citizens and cannot sue in the federal courts. Second, Congress has no authority to regulate or prohibit slavery from spreading in the territories. And third, white people have a fundamental right embedded in the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment to own black people. Those are the three things. Now, I suppose you could say Lincoln went against that holding, but Lincoln did ignore the Dred Scott decision in two other ways. In 1862, you had African Americans applying for passports to travel overseas. Only a citizen can get a passport. And so Lincoln had his attorney general write an opinion on citizenship and who can be a citizen. And guess what? Edward Bates says black people can be citizens. And the Lincoln administration begins giving black people, black men, passports to travel overseas, something that had never happened before. And that was Lincoln ignoring the Dred Scott decision. And then in 1864, I believe it was, Lincoln signs a law outlawing slavery from the territories. That too was ignoring the Dred Scott decision. The problem with laws though, and with executive orders, is that they can be very easily overturned. It only, you know, you have a Republican president who issues a lot of executive orders today, and what happens? He loses, the Democrat wins, rescinds all those executive orders. Or you have a Republican Congress pass certain laws, then Democrats win, they repeal them, pass new laws. And so Lincoln knew that these kind of decisions could be very easily overturned. And so in, when he ran for re-election, he had his platform pledged to amending the Constitution to forever end slavery. And then from the moment of his reelection until January 31st, 1865, which is the whole subject of the Spielberg movie, Lincoln devotes almost all of his attention to getting Congress to pass the 13th Amendment. Because only then can the Supreme Court and Congress and presidents and politicians be prohibited from trying to bring slavery back. So Lincoln wanted slavery forever abolished in the Constitution. And that then makes the Emancipation Proclamation and these other laws negligible. They're no longer needed because the Constitution forever says no more slavery. So again, I always try to tell, and I wrote this in the, in the beginning of Lincoln Lore in the current issue where I said I always try to get my students to realize how busy Lincoln was. Because it's so easy in the 21st century for us to Monday morning quarterback, oh, why didn't he do this? Why didn't he do that? And I try to get them to, I try to get my students to see, like, think about all of the things Lincoln is juggling. And yet, what he was able to accomplish is pretty remarkable, even with his mistakes. Did I, yeah, go ahead. Yes, Doctor, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. I am also a resident of Hampton, uh, Virginia. Oh, yeah. born and raised uh, you know, in a slave state. Yep. And one of the things that I really appreciate in your conversation is that you never use the word or describe black people as slaves. You always use the term enslaved Africans. And I really appreciate that in your conversation because we were never slaves. We were enslaved into slavery. Yeah. And that's what I appreciate. But here's my question. Even though Abraham Lincoln uh, wrote the Emancipation Proclamation and the news got to Galveston uh, two years later, most people end up making a mistake that the Emancipation Proclamation abolished slavery. But the abolishment of slavery didn't come until about, what, around, I think, December December of of 1865 when when the 13th Amendment was... was, ratified. And, and I think we need to take a look at that 
because Lincoln was really never uh, concerned about the equality of his decision. The equality of his decision? Yeah, bringing the socialization of black people into society. So I'll, I'll, I'll disagree a little bit, and that's actually the subject of my book, A House Built by Slaves, which I'm quoting Michelle Obama there, so forgive me for, you know, the, I actually got a book review. The only criticism I think this book has gotten in any book review is that I titled it A House Built by Slaves and then used the word, um, and it's like, well, I'm quoting Michelle Obama. Like, what do you want out of me? Like, I thought it was a great line from her 2016 DNC speech, and that's why I used it. So. Um, what I do in this book, did Lincoln believe in full political and social equality? No, and I'm not gonna make that argument. But that said, there was something different about the Lincoln White House than any preceding White House, and honestly, it would be 100 years until it would be back to what he did. So during the, during the 19th century, presidents held office hours, like a college professor does. Anyone who wants to could go in and talk to the president during office hours. And lots, thousands and thousands of people did. For the first year of the war, only white Americans do that. Beginning in a, of April of 1862, black Americans begin doing that as well. Free and enslaved. And rich and poor, educated and uneducated, male and female, at one point, Lincoln sees a poor man outside of the White House and says to his servant, go bring that man in. And the man comes in and said, I, I heard, I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially, I heard that you're the Constitution and that you have provisions. And I'm hungry, I need provisions. I mean, this man didn't understand the difference between provisions of the Constitution and provisions meaning food. And Lincoln says to the butler, you know, take him down to the kitchen and give him food. At one point, Lincoln saw a, a black man who would stand or sit at uh, the, the Episcopal Church right across from the White House. And Lincoln would pass him by. And Lincoln found out his story and wrote a check. He didn't know the man's name. And this check survives to the colored man with one leg and gave him $5 to help him support. I mean, Lincoln, uh, prior to April of 1862, there are very few documented cases of African Americans going into the White House other than as a servant or as an enslaved person. James K. Polk, as president, bought and sold 19 human beings from his White House office. How different then when Abraham Lincoln in April of 1862 begins welcoming black people into the White House? And he always shakes their hands. And beginning in January of 1864, black people begin attending White House receptions. And that was something that had never happened before. And they, four black men come to the January 1st New Year's reception in, in 1864, and then Two black army doctors come to a reception in February of 64, and then others come, and by January of 65, hundreds of African Americans line up because Lincoln let it be known in the newspapers that, they were, that any person was welcome. Now, very sadly with that, Mary Lincoln was not happy to see all these people of color, and she ordered that they be sent to the back of the line, and we don't know if Lincoln knew about that or not, and so some went away dejected and others waited and when all the white people had come through, Mary went upstairs and Abraham Lincoln stayed there and continued to greet the black guests at the White House. In, in, after Lincoln's death, Johnson becomes president and he is vicious towards black visitors to the White House. When, when Frederick Douglass meets with Johnson in 1866, Lincoln and Douglass had considered each other friends. When, when Douglass leaves the White House, Johnson calls him the N-word. A couple years later, Mrs. Grant is hosting a party and a servant comes to her and says, what do we do if black people come? And Mrs. Grant says, it's my party, let them in. None, none came. And if you go forward through the decades, very few black people are welcomed into the White House. And in 1901, Teddy Roosevelt invites 
Booker T. Washington to dinner. And there is outrage throughout the country. How could a president invite a black man into the White House? And they called it unprecedented. They, 40 years later, they had forgotten the barriers that had broken down during Lincoln's administration. And again, I'm not going to make the case that Lincoln brought about full social equality or political equality, because he didn't. And I don't think he was advocating for that either. But he was taking steps. And Frederick Douglass, after Lincoln's death, said that Lincoln learned his politics through chopping down trees. So you'll recall that Lincoln advocated for limited black male suffrage, the intelligent and those who have fought gallantly in our ranks. And people today say, well, why didn't he advocate for all black men voting? Well, it was 1865. Most northern states didn't allow black men to vote and didn't want them to vote. And what Douglas said Lincoln was doing, he had learned his politics by chopping down trees, by wielding an ax. And Douglas said, you put the thin edge in first. And then as you split the log, the thick end edge gets in. And Douglas understood what Lincoln was doing. You, you got to start somewhere. You, you know, we look at our leaders and we think, why can't they solve all of our problems? In a hundred years, people are going to look at us and say, why didn't they fix all their problems? And we know it. You just, you can't snap your finger and fix everything. And sometimes we look back at Lincoln and I think we expect him to have been able to do that. But Lincoln, like Douglas said, he put the thin edge in first. And sadly, he was assassinated, and a virulent racist in Andrew Johnson came in and undid a lot of what Lincoln had accomplished. And, um, you know, I always get asked what would have happened if Lincoln had survived, and my answer is always, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. But it, it was a tragic, and that's why I made the point at the end, African Americans knew that they lost more in Lincoln's death than white Americans did. And that's why they went to the White House that day. Up here. Um, Lincoln is known for his uh, political uh, guile, I'll call it, um, such as when he recruited his, some of his political enemies to be on his cabinet. Mm -hmm. and my question for you is, um, could you please explain uh, the intricacies of the Emancipation Proclamation? how it uh, limited freedom to the uh, areas yeah. where the Confederates were still under control. And, and yeah. uh, thank you, sir. And I meant, to, I meant to mention that, I think, with your question, and I totally forgot. So thank yeah, you for Yeah, some of these last couple me. questions were close to this one. So. Yeah. yeah. So the emancip you know, whenever I do, I do a lot of workshops for teachers during the summer. And I always like to start off by asking, when you hear the phrase, the Emancipation Proclamation, what do you think of? And I always get a real mix of answers. I get, and I often reframe the question and I say, if you were to ask your students, what did the Emancipation Proclamation do? And some will say it freed the slaves, and some will say it didn't do anything, and I get all sorts of answers in between. And it's a really complicated thing. So what did the proclamation do? The proclamation declared free those who were enslaved in areas of rebellion. It excluded the border states, those that remained loyal to the Union. It excluded Tennessee because the Union had captured Nashville, it had captured Memphis, it had Eastern Tennessee. Lincoln considered Tennessee as back in the Union. It excluded Hampton, Virginia, and the area from Norfolk up towards Richmond. Have any of you been to Colonial Williamsburg? Okay, so picture Colonial Williamsburg. You've got Duke of Gloucester Street. It's the main drag through Colonial Williamsburg. In 1863, one side of Duke of Gloucester Street was York County, which was excluded, and one side of Duke of Gloucester Street was James City County, which was included. So African Americans on one side of the street were declared free, and they could look across the street as peop at people on the other side who were not declared free. And it excluded all the parishes around New Orleans. And, and people often say, why would Lincoln free those who he had within Union control and not free those who he had no control over? No, sorry. Why would he free those who he had no control over and not free those in areas he had control over? Why would he do that? And, and the answer is the Constitution. So he needed a constitutional peg on which to hang the proclamation. And the, the peg he said was, this is military necessity. I have taken an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. 
in order to fulfill my oath, I have to save the nation. And I, can do, I, need to, I will do what I need to do to save the nation because in saving the nation, I preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. And you couldn't justify freeing people in Missouri if Missouri is loyal to the Union. But you can justify freeing people in Arkansas or in South Carolina. And so what I often tell my students is, if they say, well, the proclamation didn't free anyone, I say, okay, right, yes, true. It didn't free anyone in that moment that he signed it on January 1st, 1863. But as the armies move forward, and as people flock to the army, freedom spreads. And even for those soldiers who were pro-slavery, they become agents of liberation. And then those black men who join the army, they then go out fighting for freedom. And, and so the, the proclamation functioned in that way. It doesn't free anyone in that moment. And meanwhile, Lincoln is still thinking about Missouri. Lincoln is still thinking about Kentucky and Maryland and Delaware. Lincoln begins working behind the scenes in Maryland in April of 1864. Or actually, a little bit earlier. And he and Maryland Republicans amend their state constitution. It's, a, it's ratified on October 12th and 13th, 1864, the very same day that Roger Tawney died. <laughs> and it went into effect November 1st, 1864. And so I love to say the Chief Justice who wrote the Dred Scott decision and slavery in his home state of Maryland died on the very same day. And what that shows you is Lincoln knew he didn't have the constitutional authority to end slavery in Maryland, but he could work with state leaders to, to bring about its demise. And he got Maryland to do it, and in early 1865, he got Missouri to do it. Kentucky and Delaware were just too intransigent. And so Kentucky, Kentuckians, this is gonna blow your mind. <laughs> Kentuckians, after the Civil War, kept buying and selling in titles to enslaved people who had run away and were no longer in bondage they were speculating, hoping that maybe, the Kentuckians were so tightly gripping slavery, they were hoping that the state legislature would say, well, we lost slavery, but we're gonna compensate slaveholders. And so they, they speculate and buy titles to human beings after slavery's been destroyed in the hopes that they can basically get a stock windfall. And so Lincoln can't get them to end slavery. And Kentucky is one of only two states to vote against Lincoln in 1864. So they're gonna lose slavery with the 13th Amendment. But Lincoln has to take this sort of gradual approach. And for those who are worried, in Colonial Williamsburg, because the army was there, they, they knew where the line was, but they kind of said, you know what, we're gonna take over that other side and we're gonna declare everyone free. So everyone in Williamsburg became free anyway. In the way back. The Juneteenth Proclamation was read to the um, Sorry, the what proclamation? The, the, as I understand it, the Juneteenth oh, proclamation Juneteenth. Yes, I'm sorry, I misheard you. Was, was read to the formerly enslaved people who were finding it out from a Union general. Mm -hmm. I'm making an assumption here, and I'd like you to correct it if it's wrong. The reason a Union general was making it was with the proclamation and, and also, you get the idea why did it take so long, but the a Union general, because they had to be, somebody had to be occupying the former state in succession, in secession, and he was a representative of his government, and he basically said, you all got to know this. Tell yeah. me how that played out. Yeah, Galveston is right on the Gulf Coast of Texas, and very close to the Mexican border, and it was one of, Wilmington, North Carolina, and Galveston, Texas were the last two Confederate ports to fall. Wilmington falls a little bit earlier in 1865 and then Galveston very late. And in fact, my book Shipwrecked, which is about the slave trade, it's got a 19th century t subtitle with all those terms. Uh, the, the guy who was convicted of slave trading, who's sort of the center of that book, became a Confederate blockade runner going in and out of Galveston because by 1864 and 65, that was the last place blockade runners could go. So yes, it's when the army takes over, the soldiers are the, the face of the government. 
And, that, and, and again, as I said with the last question, it's as the army moves forward that freedom spreads. And it's a biracial army at that point. It's, it's black and white men. And in fact, after Appomattox, it's many black soldiers, USCTs, who are stationed in Texas to try to maintain freedom. And as I think most of you know, I mean, Reconstruction has some high points but it has some really low lows. And the army has to be present to try to preserve freedom. And as soldiers get withdrawn, ex-Confederates take back over and, and deny people rights. So uh, I think that's why it is the general, he's coming in. And they did similar things in, in 1863 when the proclamation, I mean, in Hampton, Virginia, the proclamation gets read under a tree that is still there today that I've taken my children to a number of times called Emancipation Oak. And that's where Hampton University was founded. It's now on the campus of Hampton University. And it's often, in fact, there was a, there was a businessman in New York, I think, who paid to have a million copies of the proclamation printed. And he had them distributed to soldiers so that as the army goes forward, they can give these things out to people and say, this is what declares you free. Are we out of time? Okay, thank you so much. I'm happy to chat after. Production facilities provided by Access Fort Wayne. Learn more under the Services tab at acpl.info.